This is an audio review of Chapter 5, Introduction to Sociology, Socialization. So first we're going to jump into the psychological perspectives on self-development. Freud talked about how the self is our experience of personal identity, which is separate and different from all other people. So sociologists believe the self is developed and created and modified through interactions throughout our lifespan. So Freud is usually associated with, you know, psychoanalysis, but his theories have also helped sociologists gain a better understanding of social behavior. So Freud developed the idea of the subconscious mind and the unconscious mind, which he believed control most of our drives, impulses, thoughts, and behaviors. In other words, when we get a positive response from other people, we might like that feeling, so we'll try to replicate that. This might even help us shape our personality and our sense of self. Thus, our interactions with other people may shape our sense of self. Now, we don't use everything from Freud, because Freud was using a lot of cocaine and came up with some wild stuff as well. Um, Erickson, another interesting one, believed that personality continued to change and was never truly finished. He said there were eight stages of development, ranging from birth to death. And Erickson also gave more credit to the social aspects that affect our personalities than other psychologists did. Also, Pichet, uh, you know, it looks like Piaget, but it's Pichet, was a Swiss psychologist who specialized in child development, and he was focused specifically on the role of social interactions and in child development. He recognized that the development of the self evolved through a negotiation between the world as it exists in our mind and the world that exists outside of it that's experienced as a social reality. So when looking at sociology versus psychology, you know, you put them in a case, cage match, which one comes out? No, I'm just kidding. Both of these are academic disciplines. Both of them study and are interested in human behavior. But the real difference is psychologists focus on the mind or the brain, while sociologists focus on how different aspects of society contribute to an individual's relationship with the world. Basically, when studying well, why people act like they do, psychology looks inward at the individual while sociology looks outward at the social environment, social groups, and social institutions for those answers. So let's move into sociological theories a little bit here. We've talked about these a little bit in the last chapter, but learning is repetition. So the first one here I got a cute picture for is the looking glass self. Charles Cooley, we talked about in chapter four, believed that the sense of self depends on looking at yourself reflected in interactions with others. So the looking glass self is the notion that you know, if people say that, you know, something we did was positive, then we might be more likely to do that again, right? And that we look for other people's reactions of what we do and how they react. And again, we don't read each other's minds, right? So we don't really know what people think. We just know, we, we perceive what we think uh, they, they think, and we change our behavior based on that. And again, going back to George Herbert Mead that I sprinkled in to, to chapter four as well, he looked at the self or a person's distinct identity that's developed through social interactions, right? And so he expanded on Cooley's idea and believed that the self is created through interactions and that it starts in childhood. So he thought, okay, as soon as you can speak language, you can start to develop a sense of self. So he started kind of trying to figure out the different stages of development that he saw kids having and separated them into those developmental categories. So I mentioned this a little bit in chapter four. He had these different, these three main stages, right? The preparatory stage, the play stage, and the game stage. So the first stage, again, the preparatory stage is where kids mimic or imitate others. This is like you know, little kids, they, if you say something to them, actually, it's kind of one of the funniest videos you can find out there on the internet are those ones where a kid learns a curse word and they learn pretty quickly they're not supposed to be saying it because, you know, an adult reacts negatively to it. So what do they do? They just say it over and over and over, right? It's kind of adorable and hilarious. Unless you're that parent and you're like in the middle of like, I don't know, somewhere where people are just judging you for that. So the idea though is that kids start to learn how to talk by just making noises. They learn how to act by kind of watching others around them and mimicking those things. <laughs> There's this great video that was going around where this little girl, um, because her parents are elder millennials, um, you know, she'd bend down and get something and go, ugh, 
because she was mimicking the behavior of when they bend down to grab things, they're like kind of aching, right? So that's, you know, kind of an example of that preparatory stage. It's just one of the ways in which we start to understand the social world we're living in. As you get a little bit older, you get to the second stage in the development, which is the play stage, where children pretend to play the roles of particular significant others. So again, those people that socialize you, not like your boyfriend or girlfriend, right? So basically, they demonstrate the perspectives and expectations of a particular role. So like I said before, this could be, you know, being, being I'm going to be the teacher, or I'm going to be the mom, but it can also be things like, I'm going to be the princess and I'm going to be the superhero, like taking on these different expected ideas of what adult roles are, um, which are incredibly gendered, right, which we'll talk about later. But anyway, um, so <laughs> basically the idea is the more that children kind of understand the perspectives and, and expectations of these various roles, they internalize and learn how to be different roles. Like, okay, I'm the teacher, I'm the student. So I learn what is it to be a student? What is it to be the teacher? It's kind of adorable when you watch kids do these things because it really shows you a sense of what do they think adults are doing, right? And then the third stage is, you know, development of, of the self. This is what he calls the game stage, where children start to play organized games and take on the perspective of the generalized other. So I use that example, my favorite one in chapter four, but I'm going to do it again. Soccer, right? When you have little, little kids playing soccer, it doesn't look like soccer. But once they're about 10 or 11 years old, it starts to really look like soccer. And they start to understand like their particular role on the field and how it relates to the roles and expectations of everyone else on the field, right? So what am I supposed to do with the ball? Like, who am I supposed to pass it to? You know, um, you don't think of it as just an individual thing like you're going to get it to the goal, unless you're the forward. You think about how am I going to be part of a team? right? How do I support the team? And so during this kind of process of not just do you learn your own role, you learn everyone else's role. And that gives you a larger sense of kind of that adult development that we need to understand the world we live in. So part of this also involves taking on, you know, the perspective of the generalized other or the common behavior expectations of general society. So that's what we talked about last time, that whole, what will they think? Right? You start to learn the morals and values of larger society beyond just those people who socialize to you or just the people you interact with. And you start to worry about those perceptions from generalized others. What will they think, right? Okay, so looking at more sociological theories on self-development, you have Kohlberg's theory of moral development. Moral development is an important part of the sociological process, meaning learning is considered good from what's considered bad, right? Like we have to learn that. We have to learn, okay, here's the good stuff you're supposed to do. Here's the roles and behaviors you're not supposed to do. Otherwise, how can you function smoothly in society if you don't know what the rules are? But how do people learn good from bad? Kohlberg says it happens in stages. He, again, it's always stages with these guys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he calls it, you know, pre-convention, conventional, and post-conventional. So pre-convention, really young children. They're just experiencing the world through their senses. Conventional stage happens later on, like preteen, teen years, when we become aware of other people's feelings and start to take those into consideration when we determine if what we're doing is good or bad. And post-conventional stage is when we start to think in more morally abstract terms. So the book example is that morality, or that, sorry, that morality, that morally abstract goal of Americans to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? These kind of abstract goals, like, you know, be successful in society. Well, what is successful in society, right? Those kind of more abstract terms is what we eventually understand as adults. Okay, moving to Gilligan's theory of moral development. Carol Gilligan pointed out that Kohlberg's research had a gender bias because he only conducted the research on men. So she wondered, would females have responded differently to the same research? So she suggested that men and women may have different understandings of morality. And so she did her own research and found that for men, there was more of a justice perspective, right? Placing an emphasis on rules and laws, while for women, 
there was more of what she called a care and responsibility perspective, which meant that women were more likely to consider why people do things that are considered morally wrong when determining if it's good or bad. So while Kohlberg referenced justice as right, you know, as the better perspective, Gilgan instead argued neither perspective is right or better. They're just different. And largely the results that she found that were different between men and women, she said was really the result of gendered socialization that differs between men and women in society, meaning we're raised differently. So of course that might affect the way we see the world. So also in the chapter, they talked about sociology in the real world. What a pretty little lady. So Lisa Bloom argues that we're too focused on the appearance of young girls. And as a result, our society is socializing them to believe that how they look is very important, if not the most important thing about them. We say things to little girls like, what a pretty dress you have, or oh, you're so pretty. And they might seem like harmless compliments, but we're actually reinforcing gender stereotypes. And this can have a negative impact on girls, their mental health, and their overall development. Bloom cites the fact that 50% of girls aged 3 to 6 years old worry about being fat. 3 to 6 years old. That's little kids that are toddlers through kindergarten worrying about their size because they're getting the message from society, you know, from the media, from people around them who talk to them every day that women should be thin and not fat. Sociologists are acutely interested in this type of gender socialization, which tells kids how boys should be and how they should act, how girls should be and how they should act, and reinforces a gender binary. This includes what kind of toys they should want to play with, what kind of colors they should want to wear, and for little girls, always talking about their clothes and appearance. That tells them that that's a very important part of being a girl in society. So a simple fix for this problem is to just simply talk to girls about or ask them about anything beyond just how they look or what they're wearing. You know, pretty easy. Hey, what are you interested in? Oh, you're really good at drawing? Cool, that's great. Oh, you play the piano? That's fantastic, right? Like, it doesn't just have to be about like, oh, you're pretty, right? Because we don't really do that to little boys. So why socialization matters? Socialization is important to both individuals and to society. So we're connected to our social world. Through teaching culture to new members of society, kids in this case, society perpetuates itself as it moves from generation to generation. If a new generation doesn't learn the societal way of life, it ceases to exist. So this is kind of why, you know, if you think about um, the indigenous, um, those schools, the what they call residential schools or the boarding schools, where they would basically steal Um, these native or indigenous children from their parents and send them to these boarding schools where they weren't allowed to practice cultural traditions. They weren't allowed to speak cultural languages. Um, They basically, what's what we call cultural genocide, where you don't allow people to practice their custom relief, uh, you know, beliefs, religions, etc. But taking kids from a young age so that they don't learn the language, that they don't, you know, retain that information has actually destroyed or ended cultures, right? And that was really the goal of this kind of assimilation by force that happened, you know, all through North America, but especially, of course, in, you know, um, the U.S. and Canada, and was some sometimes orchestrated by the actual institution of the church itself or the government itself to basically kidnap kids from their parents and then send them to these boarding schools where you know, they're taught to be Christian, they're taught to speak English, they're taught to, um, you know, kind of devalue the cultural identities that they were grown with. And of course, we also learned about a lot of these residential schools that, you know, a lot of children were assaulted, were sexually assaulted, and were actually killed in, you know, they're unearthing a lot of these mass graves all across North America in the U.S. and Canada, where some of these children were buried on the property of these things. So we're finally starting to kind of call attention to these horrible things in the past. But I mean, some of these residential schools operated up until like the 1970s. So we're not talking about like a super long time ago. Um, But that's an example of how you need a culture to continue to teach something or it goes away. So as those last elders that know the languages die, they take with them those cultural traditions, right? Okay, so 
Socialization is important for individuals as well because social interaction provides the means through which we gradually become able to understand ourselves. And it's really kind of that looking glass, you know, through the eyes of others. We learn who we are and how we're supposed to fit into the world around us. To function successfully in society, we have to learn the basics of both material and non-material culture. For instance, how to dress ourselves, what clothes are appropriate to what situation, right? What we learn like when to sleep and what are you supposed to sleep on? We learn what is appropriate to eat as well as how to use a stove or pans or other things that make a meal possible. And most importantly, we learn language which we need in order to communicate with each other as well as to be able to think in culturally intelligible ways. So this whole nature v. nurture debate thing is so dumb. It's just so dumb. Some say that we're who we are strictly because of genetics or because of nature, while others say who we are is just the result of our relationships or those we come in contact with, which is called nurture. While many debate which is the, you know, which it is, it's actually, it's both, <laughs> right? Um, you know, or even just like with the recent understandings of epigenetics, it's actually complicated. Like sometimes the factors that influence what you do actually has to do with what your grandparents did and how that affected, you know, um, your parent in utero that then affected the way that they had you. So it's just kind of wild. Like, yes, biology is important. It is like as a sociologist, we have to understand, yes, who you are. Um, your biological propensity for something is important, but the environment you're in is also very important. So for instance, let's say you have a biological, uh, you know, predisposition towards developing asthmatic conditions. Like my grandfather, basically living up in Canada, they were like, hey, you should move to Southern California so you can breathe better. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? And you're just like, wow, um, that's... That it was not the case for a while there. But anyway, the idea of like dry air, right? Or, or hotter air instead of the kind of cold, crisp, dry air of, of, you know, Canada. And so the idea is that like, let's say, you know, um, you have a predisposition towards a certain kind of situation, whether you're exposed to it or not is what affects it. So like, for instance, if you're likely, or if you have some genetic predisposition towards, you know, asthma, and you end up living in the LA basin where you're breathing in a bunch of smog and things that actually would cause more asthma, your likelihood of developing those symptoms becomes stronger, right? So it's, it's nature and it's nurture, right? And they gave this example in the chapter, kind of a long example, of Chris Langan, basically that to show how complicated the interplay between genetics and socialization can be. So dude has a 195 IQ. But due to the fact that he was super poor and moved a lot as a kid and had an abusive alcoholic father, he didn't get socialized into middle class values. So his genius went unnoticed and undeveloped. So he also faced issues in college. He ended up losing his scholarship and receiving a bunch of Fs. And he transferred to another school, but the admin wouldn't rearrange his class schedule. Since he didn't have transportation, he couldn't get to class. So he ended up dropping out of college. So even though he's brilliant, he lacked the social knowledge of how to navigate those situations, which may have resulted in him completing college and having many more opportunities to use that brain. But what he lacked was practical knowledge or what to say to whom and when to make things happen in a way that would have worked for him. So he should have been socialized to know how to do this, but he wasn't. So no matter what his genetics were, he ended up in menial blue collar jobs. Right? So it, it's both. It's our nature and it's our nurture. Right, the, Both things are important. Okay, so three main paradigms on socialization. So functionalists would say that socialization is essential to society because it trains members of society to operate successfully within it and because it perpetuates culture by transmitting it to another generation. Conflict theorists would argue that socialization just ends up reproducing inequality from generation to generation by conveying different expectations and norms to those with different social characteristics. So basically, we're socialized differently based on our race, our social class, our gender, among other identities, into expectations and roles which will be different and lead to unequal opportunities. And symbolic interactionists would say that meaning is made through interaction, so they'd focus on how socialization helps us learn to interact. 
and the ways that our social exchanges are imbued with symbolic communication. So the book uses the example that, you know, if like pink is for girls and blue is for boys, that that's not inherent. That's something you need to learn from society to understand its meaning. Actually, side fun fact on that one. You know, it used to be the opposite. It used to be that pink was for boys and blue was for girls. It's actually kind of interesting phenomenon. So red was considered kind of like a heroic color. And so pink was like a watered down red. So it was for boys. And blue was associated with, um, you know, the Virgin Mary, you know, Lady of Guadalupe kind of thing. So blue is for girls. <laughs> and actually before that, uh, there wasn't really a gendered thing for babies. They just put everyone in like a white dress, male or female, because again, kids are just going to throw up and crap and, you know, basically mess themselves all over those smocks. Made sense. They just made them white and they just bleached them. But like, that's why you can like look up like uh, Teddy Roosevelt and there's just like a picture of him as a baby in a little white dress, right? <laughs> so just a fun note, there is no inherent gendered meaning behind these colors but they're so important to us like I had friends growing up that like they couldn't get anywhere near a pastel color or pink or anything like that because they were so afraid that that would convey that they weren't masculine right so it's really interesting it's like colors are just a meaning that we put on top of that and like I said they changed like kind of recently in social history but we just kind of assume our reality from today is a linear thing backwards that it's always been that way when in reality, and you look back into the past, oftentimes some of the things we take for granted as like always have been that way have only been that way for maybe 50 to 100 years or less. And we're just, we just don't know the world that came before us very well. Okay, so different agents of socialization. These are the people that socialize us. So there's social group agents and institutional agents. So social group agents are the ones that provide our first experience of socialization. So families are our first agent of socialization. Right? They teach us the basics and the essentials. Our families teach us how to use objects, how to relate to others, and how the world works. So socialization of children does not happen in a vacuum. We can use our sociological imagination to recognize that individual behaviors are affected by the historical period in which we're in. So for example, 60 years ago, it was not really considered child abuse for a father to hit his son with a belt for misbehaving. But today, we might consider the same actions as child abuse. Sociologists recognize that race, social class, religion, gender, all these other societal factors play an important role in socialization. So for example, poor families often emphasize obedience and conformity in their kids, while wealthy families emphasize judgment and creativity in their children. Basically, children are raised to take the kind of jobs their parents have. So the skills their parents teach them are skills they need to navigate those social worlds. But the consequences of this is, is that we accidentally reproduce social classes and like social class values differently. Okay, another social group agent is our peers. These are the people who are similar in age and social status and share our interest. This starts when we're on the playground or at recess. Peer groups are very important to us in adolescence. It's when we stop caring as much what our parents or families think and start caring more about what our peers think. Our peers help us develop an identity separate from our parents and help us exert our independence. Peer groups provide their own socialization since people do different activities with their friends than they do with their families. So peers are a major influence on us when we're teens and they continue to be one, a, a major influence on us as we age. Then there's the institutional agents. So formal institutions also inform our socialization. And they teach us how to behave in and how to navigate systems. So some examples are education, workplaces, religion, government, other institutions like the media inundate, it, inundate us all the time with messages about what social norms we're supposed to accept. So first up, school. Kids spend about seven days, or seven days, <laughs> sorry, seven hours a day in school. And when kids are in school, they're learning more than just the subjects like math and English. They're also learning the latent function of socializing children into behaviors like practicing teamwork, following a schedule, using textbook, like reading for Christ's sake, right? And other school and classroom rituals. So these rituals are led by teachers who serve as role models for what's appropriate to do in the classroom. 
They reinforce what society expects from children, or what we call the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is this informal teaching done by schools that prepares children for the adult world. For example, the hidden curriculum teaches kids to deal with bureaucracy, right? Like, sorry, that's the rules. Um, you know, to deal with the kind of rules and expectations of adult life, like having to wait your turn, having to sit still for hours a day, really just having to like show up at a time and a place and defer to an authority figure. That definitely makes you ready for the work world. Schools also socialize children by teaching them about citizenship and national pride, like how we all learn how to say the Pledge of Allegiance each morning, which is... Ooh, right? It's kind of indoctrinating. It's actually very funny, though, to, like, if you've ever heard a group of kindergartners try and say the Pledge of Allegiance, like, indivisible, like, those moments, um, they, it's just kind of like, mur, 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 mur. like, they don't really know what the words mean yet, right? So, you know, even textbooks themselves evolve as our social understandings change, right? There's a lot of controversy going on. Well, I mean, really, anytime you get textbooks out of Texas, you're going to have problems, but, um, you know, there's been a lot of pushback by politicians trying to get reelected in certain areas by saying, oh, you know, we can't have critical race theory taught to children, which it's not. It's not. No one teaches critical race theory to children. Like, that's so dumb. It's a graduate level law concept. Like, <laughs> it's something that at Cal State Fullerton we discuss in a couple of my upper division courses. But that's it. Like, kids aren't learning that. That's so dumb. So basically, there's certain states now that they've tried to pass laws to say that you can't talk about things in the classroom or use textbook materials that quote unquote make white people uncomfortable. And what's interesting about this, Ibram X. Kendi talked about this, the guy who wrote the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. He was saying, now, why don't we want kids to learn the real history of the United States? Why don't we want them to understand the horrors of slavery? and Jim Crow segregation, and all of the other inequities that have plagued our country. Because remember, if we don't learn the reality of society, we're doomed to repeat it. By the time you learn a lot of that stuff, you're too old to really care. Like, for instance, like, think about, like, the first Thanksgiving. We learn, like, you know, the pilgrims and the Indians, they sat down, they broke bread, and everyone was happy. But we don't learn about, like, the Trail of Tears, and the smallpox blankets, and the just, like, complete genocide of indigenous groups, not until maybe we're in high school or college, right? Before that, we just make, like, we trace our hand, make a little turkey, and we're like, yay, everyone was happy. But that creates this false reality for children. And oftentimes, that's an earlier socialization that people don't unlearn when they do learn the tragic realities of what actually happened. So we're totally doomed to repeat history especially in this time period where we don't want people to talk about like the don't say gay kind of bills where you can't acknowledge um, same sex couples or same sex families as reality or even, you know, students that are queer. And, um, you know, basically these other ones that are talking about race and being very restrictive about talking about the realities, the history of our country that is just real. Um, because it might make people that are white feel uncomfortable to know that their ancestors enslaved people. What's interesting, though, again, going back to Ibram X. Kendi, he said, why don't we have any faith in these white children? Like, why don't we assume that maybe this white kid is going to actually identify more with the abolitionists? Meaning there were plenty of white folks who were like, you know what? Slavery is bad in the time periods when it happened and fought with their lives and with their freedom and with their privilege and power to end the institution of slavery. So the idea of like teaching kids the history of this stuff, why would they relate more to the slave master than the person that was the abolitionist, right? Ibram X. Kendi was really kind of making a great point there, saying like, why don't we just teach children reality and let that fall where it may, right? The idea of like, oh, you don't want to make kids a little uncomfortable, and you're like, well, slavery was very uncomfortable. Jim Crow segregation or even mass incarceration that we currently have is very uncomfortable. The fact that, you know, people were, you know, forced into institutions and sometimes even lobotomized for being, you know, queer is uncomfortable. Like a lot of these realities that we have restricted the rights and opportunities of entire groups of people is uncomfortable, but it's reality. And if they don't learn reality, how the hell can they live in the world that we actually live in? Right? They can't. But anyway, so <laughs> moving on, because otherwise I'll just keep going off about it. Okay, the workplace. Just as kids spend most of their time in school, most adults spend most of their time at work. 
Workers are socialized into new workspaces in both material and non-material ways. Because different jobs require different socialization, right? So people used to work one job until retirement, but nowadays it's much more common to switch jobs pretty much once a decade. Religion's also important to socialization for many people. Like churches, temples, synagogues, mosques, or other religious gathering places are where people gather and worship and learn. Religious groups teach participants how to interact with religious material and non-material culture. Like, for instance, um, I grew up Catholic. Um, I mean, full disclosure, I'm an atheist. But anyway, grew up Catholic, and the, the best example of this that I can think of is if you've ever been to any sort of Catholic mass or, or you know, funeral service or anything like that, there's a lot of, like, kneeling, standing, and sitting. And you have to know, like, okay, this is the part where we stand. This is the part where we kneel. This is the part where we sit. And if you don't know, like, okay, this is the part where I say this or do that, it can be very awkward to navigate those spaces. So the institutions teach you how to act within those spaces. So for some, religious celebrations are really important ceremonies that are related to family structures, such as for marriage or birth. And many religions uphold gender norms that contribute to the enforcement through socialization. Government's another important institutional agent. Many rites of passage based on age norms have been established by the government. For instance, when does someone become an adult? Well, the government says you do at 18. That's when you legally become an adult. Also, the government says you're allowed to get a driver's license when you're 16. And then at 21, you're allowed to drink. And that, you know, basically you're old when you hit 65 and then you hit the age of retirement. So in a lot of ways, we think about age, it's actually directly related to how the government has determined these stages or legal thresholds or laws. And then, of course, the mass media. This one's a huge one, and I do research on this myself, so I'm going to try and be succinct, but I'm not great at that. So the mass media distributes impersonal information to a wide audience through mediums like television, film, radio, newspapers, and the Internet. Media doesn't just entertain us and inform us. It also influences our accepted social norms. It's through the media that we see and learn about material, non-material culture. When it comes to the non-material, the beliefs, the values, the norms, the ones the media gives us are incredibly influential. By the time we're 15 years old, we've spent more time watching commercials than being in school, which is staggering. And what messages or values the media promotes is going to affect the socialization of people, especially of children. So the book looks at examples of Pixar and Disney films with this emphasis on princesses. So most media for children does not feature women as the main character, but the genre of princess films does center females. But really, it's often a story of getting married or finding some prince and not really about her becoming better or growing or achieving herself, save like Mulan. Almost all the animated Disney films sent these terrible messages to little girls about adult relationships. So, for example, Little Mermaid, it says, you don't need a voice to get a man. You just need a sexy body. Just shake your ass in front of him. Right. You don't need to be able to talk to be interested a man. Um, silence yourself and he'll like you. Uh, Beauty and the Beast is just straight up Stockholm syndrome. Right. It's straight up like identifying with your captor. I mean, Cinderella, the focus is the escape from her life situation and on the happily ever after. And, you know, how did he fall in love with her? It was at first sight. So basically, if she looked as busted as her stepsisters and not incredibly beautiful, then she'd still be cooking their meals, cleaning their big ass house and doing her stepsister's laundry. But luckily, she was so pretty. And the whole small foot thing, I can't even. There's so much weird cultural historical beliefs behind that. I can't even. You have Sleeping Beauty, which, you know, has a lot of iffy consent issues. I mean, she's sleeping. And some dude she met once is going to kiss her with no affirmative consent. For me, though, I love that movie. <laughs> it was one of those ones I watch, I watch a lot as a kid. And, you know, the dude is the hero. He's fighting the dragon. And arguably a woman is strong, but she's the villain. Another interesting trope that pops up in a lot of Disney films, like the 101 at Dalmatians, Little Mermaid with Ursula, etc. But anyway... It's the latent messages these kind of films teach little girls to want to be a princess, but a princess is passive. They also equate being beautiful with being good. And again, this is a very white version of beauty. European hair and features, and they equate being bad with being ugly. So the message is subtle and sometimes not so subtle, but it tells little boys that they can, ha they can be the hero and save the girl, and it teaches girls they need saving, and that 
they need to have some prince rescue them. The whole thing is toxic AF. Okay, moving on to socialization throughout the life course. Socialization does not stop when we're little kids. Once we have a basic understanding of the world, it keeps happening because the world changes and so do we. And all the while, we need to know what we're doing and how to do it. And that's where socialization comes in. Many of life's social expectations are made clear and reinforced on a cultural level. Through interacting with others and also through watching other people interact, the expectations to fulfill roles becomes clearer to us. So you have educational expectations, which can vary from culture to culture, but they also differ within one culture like our own. When you account for social class, you can see that middle class and upper class parents have very different educational expectations for their children than parents who are struggling in poverty. Middle class and rich students can get into four-year universities. They're support, you know, really expected to graduate by their parents. They're often financially supported through the process. And it's obvious, you know, how expensive college is with how expensive rent is that kids whose parents pay their rent and pay for their education, they're going to have a much chiller time keeping up with the expectations of college than, you know, the students like me who worked multiple jobs through college. And to be clear, my parents wanted me to graduate college, but they weren't financially able to support me through all of it, right? Just as with my husband, we both come from more working class turned lower middle class households where college was the goal, but his parents didn't pay for his college or any of his siblings. And as a result, most of them started, but ended up dropping out or tried to get, you know, specific credentials instead of a degree, right? Like um, one of my brothers-in-law went to one of those like phony TV schools, like the ones you see on TV, like you spend all day on the phone anyhow, why don't you make a phone little help call that'll help you in your future? Like those kind of Everest college ones. Um, that are like trade schools, but then they end up just kind of putting you right back in a minimum wage job. It's really hard to keep self-motivated and work and go to school, but it's, in, it's possible because here I is, right? I did it. And really starting at the community college and ending up with a graduate degree, it's about 2% of people. And I'm not some super special 2%. I just think that, um, each one of you has the exact same potential that I do. And so I wasn't the best student. I wasn't perfect. I made mistakes. I had housing insecurity, all sorts of crap I went through. And yet I think that really what helped me was having some of those expectations from them and really having some social support that really helped me get through it. And I'm very privileged and, and lucky to have done so. But um, I know that when it comes to those expectations, you know, whether you think your kids are going to go to school or graduate from college, it's going to be related to your own social class. So for some families, it's like you're going to need your job, your kid to get a full-time job immediately just to be able to keep the roof over the head, right? Like just to help support the family. So that's going to be the priority over getting a higher education because, you know, you need the lights on, you need the food on the table. And that can come at a cost of an education or really just the fact that we often don't think about this, but who benefits from college being very expensive? Like we think about who's marginalized, obviously the poor or even like, you know, even the middle class really these days, it's so incredibly expensive. Even they can't afford it, right? They have to go into debt. So who benefits from that? It's the rich people. Why? Because their kids that are crappy don't have to compete with your kids, right? Their kids went to the best schools, had the best tutors. They still couldn't get into UCLA and had to like have their head photoshopped on some lacrosse player right as we saw in those college admission scandals and yet you know they're able to get those opportunities right they don't have to compete with you or i because you know they have been able to kind of jump through some of those hurdles just by having wealth and power so you know for rich families it's kind of a second thought those students can really thrive and they can avoid the barriers that poor students face like having to really be really careful with your time management, right? I, I always worked more than one job through college and it's really difficult. Sometimes you miss assignments. Sometimes you bomb a test because you just don't have the time that you need. You still need to pay your rent, but you need to also study for stuff. And it can be really difficult to balance those things, right? Which rich folks don't have to worry about. Um, also, talk about triggering. There's this whole section in the chapter talking about the long road to adulthood for millennials. Boof. I feel that one personally. 
So the 2008 economic crash was not by accident, but by design. It made a lot of rich people richer, and then they played fast and loose with the entire global economy, yet none of the banksters went to jail. They also messed up the entire trajectory of a generation. So I am that chapter example as an elder millennial. It was me that got screwed for sure. <laughs> Actually, I remember the speech at my college graduation. The commencement speaker was like, the economy is crashed and you're all screwed. And it was like, yep, pretty much. So jobs and work opportunities were at a historical low. Not being able to find work after college, many stayed in dead-end jobs and even moved back in with their parents for years because of those bleak prospects. So the traditional cycle of milestones that people followed for decades, like you graduate from college, you get married, you buy a house, you have kids, all of that was thrown off course. So what makes college harder now than in the 70s? Well, the cost of it, right? That's a huge one. I mean, a lot of colleges were free up until that time period or very low cost, where you'd only have to work a couple hours a day to be able to support it. Versus, you know, the other thing too is, what can you do with your degree, right? Back in the day, you got a bachelor's degree and you were set. Nowadays, it seems like you almost need, like a bachelor's degree is almost like the high school diploma, right? Um, and also, what about getting married? Why would less millennials do that than previous generations? Use your sociological imagination. Well, as a person who very recently had a reception finally for getting married during the pandemic, I gotta tell you, it costs a hell of a lot of money. Also, the meaning of marriage has changed. It's not compulsory anymore. And it's less often connected to religious ceremonies than it was in the past. What about buying a house? Oh, these damn millennials, they just don't want to buy a house. That's not true. It's just like ungodly expensive out there, right? It's just not possible for a lot of people. The cost and the availability. Why aren't they having kids? All of the above, right? No money. Uh, difficult jobs, less stability, often multiple jobs. And with little min money and free time, if you're struggling, adding hungry you know, mouths on top of that seems like a pretty bad bet. Also, access to contraceptives and abortion can give people the choice to not have kids and not have them by accident, right? Um, but again, because of politics and because of Supreme Court decisions and things like that, um, that's also a problem in our modern society where people are basically going to be forced to carry children out because of, you know, mandates on their bodies from the state. So again, just not before I go down that rabbit hole, we'll go to, we'll talk about that in a different chapter, but a lot of millennials are doing those things. They're just taking a lot longer to do them than in previous generations, which has some positive and negative consequences. So some call millennials the boomerang generation since they graduated college and often end up back with their parents. What kills me again is how the media portrays, portrays this. It's like that, um, you know that meme, this is fine, where the dog with the little hats in the room that's on fire and he's just sitting there. That's how the media treats what millennials face. Let me explain. They act like we just decided not to buy houses. Like a bunch of weirdos would have converted buses into houses if the cost of housing wasn't at an all-time high. It's so dumb. They cover their eyes, they ignore the fire around them, or the context, and what we're left with is these mindless articles and segments on TV news about millennials have ruined malls, they've ruined retail stores, they've ruined the travel industry, housing, blah, blah, blah. But really what they should say is, this generation, this entire generation, all the following generations, including, including yours, have less money, less opportunities, and less hope, which is why they aren't, you know, milling around the mall like the baby boomers spending their cash because we don't have that money. We're spending it on rent. We're spending it on college. We're spending it on medical bills, on technology, on credit card debt. And that's what the media should say. But that might offend their corporate sponsors that literally just want you to buy stuff. So talking about, you know, talking real about what's going on is not good for their interest. Better that people just think millennials are angry and wasting their money on avocado toast instead of buying a house. Okay, rant over. Sorry. <laughs> In the process of socialization, adulthood brings new sets of challenges and expectations for roles to fill. For instance, what is cool to do changes as we get socially pressured by those around us. So going out and partying in college is normal and socially rewarded. But doing the same thing in your 30s and 40s, not so much. Then you are expected to have kids and be married and settle down, all that crap. The closer you get to the milestones, the more social pressure you get to conform. 
again, it was 15 years before we even got engaged. And trust me, I heard about it. I heard about it a lot. I heard about it from like all my family members. But what was funny for me is I had actually a precedent on each side of my family. Older cousins that were older than me that they had been together for many years and done the same thing. So I, it wasn't like it was super abnormal. It's just a new normal. Also, when it comes to just work, sometimes we fake it till we make it. We have a bunch of folks out here with this imposter syndrome. Just as little kids pretend to be adults, adults also engage in anticipatory socialization, preparing for future roles, like living with your significant other before getting married, having pets before kids, saving up for retirement in your working years. Any transition to a new role can be really difficult. Um, Resocialization is when old behaviors that were helpful in previous roles are removed because they're no longer needed and you learn new ones. The process of resocialization can be more stressful because people have to unlearn stuff to relearn other stuff. So we get these old people like, back in my day, it was this way. And you're like, yeah, it's not that day anymore. Um, total institution is where people are isolated from society and forced to someone else's rules. So this could be like a boarding school, a jail, the military, a cult or religious convents or monasteries. Basically, this involves a degradation ceremony where new members use their identities and are given new ones. They, they lose their original one. So like losing your name when you go to prison, you become a number. It strips you of your old identity and it builds a new one for you that matches the new society. Or like going through basic training when entering the military. So when you leave a total institution, this can be very challenging as you have to re-socialize. This is something very difficult for some total institutions coming like from prison to freedom can be really challenging or people coming back from military service. It's a very different schedule, a different life. The transition back can be very challenging. Like imagine being in jail for decades and then someone decides like when you sleep, when you eat, when you do what you do. And now all of a sudden you have no structure and that change can be really challenging. So as we see through this lecture, you know, socialization, it is important in our childhood. It sets up who we are, but it's also something that we continue to do throughout our entire lifetime. And it's important to understand how that functions as well.